French Campaign in Egypt and Syria, Wikipedia Audio Ottoman Empire Salim III, Ka R Yusuf Zaa 1 4th Din Pasha, Mustafa Pasha, Jezar Pasha, Murad Bey, Ibrahim Bey, William Sidney Smith, Ralph Abercrombie A Euro Napoleon Bonaparte Jean Baptiste KLA Copyright Ber A Euro, Thomas Alexander Dumas, Frana OIS Paul Bruis D.A. Galeers A Euro. Preparations and Voyage Ottoman Empire, 220,000. The French campaign in Egypt and Syria was Napoleon Bonaparte's campaign in the Ottoman territories of Egypt and Syria proclaimed to defend French trade interests, weaken Britain's access to British India, and to establish scientific enterprise in the region. It was the primary purpose of the Mediterranean Campaign of 1798, a series of naval engagements that included the capture of Malta. Mamlux, Baalik of Tunis, Regency of Algiers on the scientific front, the expedition eventually led to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, creating the field of Egyptology. Despite many decisive victories and an initially successful expedition into Syria, Napoleon and his Arma copyright ed Orient were eventually forced to withdraw, after sowing political disharmony in France, experiencing conflict in Europe and suffering the defeat of the supporting French fleet at the Battle of the Nile. At the time of the invasion, the Directoire had assumed executive power in France. It would resort to the army to maintain order in the face of the Jacobin and Royalist threats, and count in particular on General Bonaparte, already a successful commander, having led the Italian campaign. The notion of annexing Egypt as a French colony had been under discussion since Frana OIS Baron de Tot undertook a secret mission to the Levant in 1777 to determine its feasibility. Baron de Tot's report was favourable, but no immediate action was taken. Nevertheless, Egypt became a topic of debate between Talleyrand and Napoleon which continued in their correspondence during Napoleon's Italian campaign. In early 1798, Bonaparte proposed a military expedition to seize Egypt. In a letter to the Directoire, he suggested this would protect French trade interests, attack British commerce, and undermine Britain's access to India and the East Indies since Egypt was well placed on the trade routes to these places. Bonaparte wished to establish a French presence in the Middle East, with the ultimate dream of linking with France's ally Tipu Sultan, ruler of Mysore in India. As France was not ready for a head-on attack on Great Britain itself, the Directoire decided to intervene indirectly and create a double port connecting the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, prefiguring the Suez Canal. At the time, Egypt had been an Ottoman province since 1517, but was now out of direct Ottoman control, and was in disorder, with dissension among the ruling Mamluk elite. In France, Egyptian fashion was in full swing A Euro intellectuals believed that Egypt was the cradle of Western civilization and wished to conquer it. French traders already based on the River Nile were complaining of harassment by the Mamluks, and Napoleon wished to walk in the footsteps of Alexander the Great. He assured the Directoire that as soon as he had conquered Egypt, he will establish relations with the Indian princes and, together with them, attack the English in their possessions. According to a February 13, 1798 report by Talleyrand, having occupied and fortified Egypt, we shall send a force of 15,000 men from Suez to the Sultanate of Mysore, 
to join the forces of Tipu Sultan and drive away the English. The Directoire agreed to the plan in March 1798, though troubled by its scope and cost. However, they saw that it would remove the popular and overambitious Napoleon from the center of power, though this motive long remained secret. Rumors became rife as 40,000 soldiers and 10,000 sailors were gathered in French Mediterranean ports. A large fleet was assembled at Toulon, 13 ships of the line, 14 frigates, and 400 transports. To avoid interception by the British fleet under Nelson, the expedition's target was kept secret. It was known only to Bonaparte himself his generals Berthier and Caffarelli, and the mathematician Gaspard Monge. Bonaparte was the commander, with subordinates including Thomas Alexander Dumas, KLA copyright Burr, de Sakes, Berthier, Caffarelli, Lons, Damas, Murat, Andra copyright Aussie, Belliard, Menu, and Zaja, Czech. His aides-de-camp included his brother Louis Bonaparte, Duroc, Yuga Eni de Beauharnais, Thomas Prosper Julian, and the Polish nobleman Joseph Sulkowski. Army of Egypt, 80,001, Army of Rhodes, 20,000, Army of Syria, 20,000, Army of the East. 30,000, 2nd Invasion of Egypt, 60,000. The fleet at Toulon was joined by squadrons from Genoa, Civitavecchia and Bastia and was put under the command of Admiral Bruis and Contra-Amirals Villeneuve, Du Chela, de Grès and Gantome. The fleet was about to set sail when a crisis developed with Austria and the Directoire recalled Bonaparte in case war broke out. The crisis was resolved in a few weeks, and Bonaparte received orders to travel to Toulon as soon as possible. It is claimed that, in a stormy meeting with the Directoire, Bonaparte threatened to dissolve them and Directoire Riubel gave him a pen saying sign there, General. Proposal Bonaparte arrived at Toulon on May 9, 1798, lodging with Benoît registered trademark T. Georges de Najac, the officer in charge of preparing the fleet. The army embarked confident in their commander's talent and on May 19, just as he embarked, Bonaparte addressed the troops, especially those who had served under him in the Arma Copyright e d'Italie. Soldiers you are one of the wings of the French army. You have made war on the mountains, on the plains, and in cities, it remains for you to fight on the seas. The Roman legions, that you sometimes imitated but no longer equaled, fought Carthage now on this same sea and now on the plains of Zama. Soldiers, sailors, you have been neglected until this day, today. The greatest concern of the Republic is for you. The genius of liberty, which made you, at her birth, the arbiter of Europe, wants to be genius of the seas and the furthest nations. When Napoleon's fleet arrived off Malta, Napoleon demanded that the Knights of Malta allow his fleet to enter the port and take on water and supplies. Grand Master von Hompisch replied that only two foreign ships would be allowed to enter the port at a time. Under that restriction, revictualling the French fleet would take weeks, and it would be vulnerable to the British fleet of Admiral Nelson. Napoleon therefore ordered the invasion of Malta. The French Revolution had significantly reduced the Knights' income and their ability to put up serious resistance. Half of the knights were French, and most of these knights refused to fight. French troops disembarked in Malta at seven points on the morning of June 11th. Gen. 
Luis Baragui de Hilliers landed soldiers and cannon in the western part of the main island of Malta, under artillery fire from Maltese fortifications. The French troops met some initial resistance but pressed forward. The Knights' ill-prepared force in that region, numbering only about 2,000, regrouped. The French pressed on with their attack. After a fierce gun battle lasting 24 hours, most of the Knights' force in the West surrendered. Napoleon, during his stay in Malta, resided at Palazzo Parisio in Valletta. Napoleon then opened negotiations. Faced with vastly superior French forces and the loss of western Malta, von Hompisch surrendered the main fortress of Valletta. Napoleon departed Malta for Egypt. After successfully eluding detection by the Royal Navy for 13 days, the fleet was in sight of Alexandria where it landed on July 1, although Napoleon's plan had been to land elsewhere. On the day of the landing, Napoleon told his troops I promise to each soldier who returns from this expedition, enough to purchase six arpents of land and added. Before departure from Toulon. Capture of Malta. The peoples we will be living alongside are Muslims, their first article of faith is there is no other God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Do not contradict them, treat them as you treated the Jews, the Italians, respect their muftis and their imams as you respected their rabbis and bishops. Have the same tolerance for the ceremonies prescribed by the Koran, for their mosques, as you had for the convents, for the synagogues, for the religion of Moses and that of Jesus Christ. The Roman legions used to protect all religions. You will here find different customs to those of Europe, you must get accustomed to them. The people among whom we are going treat women differently to us, but in every country whoever violates one is a monster. Pillaging only enriches a small number of men, it dishonors us, it destroys our resources, it makes enemies of the people who it is in our interest to have as our friends. The first city we will encounter was built by Alexander. We shall find at every step great remains worthy of exciting French emulation. Alexandria to Syria Disembarkment at Alexandria Victory on land, defeat at sea Bonaparte's administration of Egypt Revolt of Cairo Menu had been the first to set out for Egypt, and was the first Frenchman to land. Bonaparte and KLA copyright Burr landed together and joined Menu at night at the Marabou, on which the first French tricolor to be hoisted in Egypt was raised. Bonaparte was informed that Alexandria intended to resist him and he rushed to get a force ashore. At 2 a.m. he set off marching in three columns, arriving by surprise beneath Alexandria's walls and ordering an assault a euro the enemy gave up and fled. The city had not had time to surrender and put itself at the French's discretion but, despite Bonaparte's orders, the French soldiers broke into the city. On July 1 Napoleon, aboard the ship L'Orient en route to Egypt, wrote the following proclamation to the Muslim inhabitants of Alexandria. For too long the Bays who govern Egypt have insulted the French nation and covered their traitors in slanders. The hour of their punishment has come. For too long this horde of slaves, bought in the Caucasus and Georgia, have tyrannized the most beautiful part of the world, but God, on whom all depends, has ordained that their empire shall end. People of Egypt, they have told you that I come to destroy your religion, but do not believe it, in reply I come to restore your rights, punish the usurpers and that I respect God, his prophet, and the Koran more than the Mamluks. Tell them that all men are equal before God, 
wisdom, talents, virtues are the only things to make one man different from another. Is there a more beautiful land? It belongs to the Mamluks. If Egypt is their farm, then they should show the lease that God gave them for it. Caddis, Cheeks, Imans, Chorbadjis, and notables of the nation tell the people that we are true friends of Muslims. Wasn't it us who destroyed the Knights of Malta? Wasn't it us who destroyed the Pope who used to say that he had a duty to make war on Muslims? Wasn't it us who have at all times been friends to the great Lord and enemies to his enemies? Thrice happy are those who will be with us. They shall prosper in their fortune and in their rank. Happy are those who will be neutral. They will get to know us over time, and join their ranks with ours. But unhappy, thrice unhappy, are those who shall arm themselves for the Mamluks and who shall fight against us. There shall be no hope for them, they shall perish. Syria when the whole expeditionary force had been disembarked, Admiral Bruis received orders to take the fleet to Abukir Bay before anchoring the battle fleet in the old port of Alexandria if possible or taking it to Corfu. These precautions were made vital by the imminent arrival of the British fleet, which had already been seen near Alexandria 24 hours before the French fleet's arrival. It was wisest to avoid the risks of a naval battle a Euro a defeat could have disastrous results and it was in the forces better interests to go by land, marching at top speed to Cairo to frighten the enemy commanders and surprise them before they could put any defense measures in place. Louis de Sakes marched across the desert with his division and two cannon, arriving at de Menhur, 15 miles from Alexandria on 18 Messeter. Meanwhile, Bonaparte left Alexandria, leaving the city under KLA copyright Burr's command. General Dugwa marched on Rosetta, with orders to seize and hold the entrance to the port housing the French fleet, which had to follow the route to Cairo down the river's left bank and rejoin the army at Romania copyright. On 20 Messeter, Bonaparte arrived at de Menhur, where he found the forces that had met up, and on 22 Messeter they marched to Romania copyright, where they then awaited the fleet with their provisions. The fleet arrived on 24 Messeter and the army began to march again at night, followed by the fleet. The wine's violence suddenly forced the fleet to the army's left and straight into the enemy fleet which was supported by musket fire from 4,000 Mamluks, reinforced by peasants and Arabs. The French fleet had numerical superiority but still lost its gunboats to the enemy. Attracted by the sound of gunfire, Bonaparte ordered his land force to the charge and attacked the village of Chebris, which was captured after two hours' fierce fighting. The enemy fled in disorder towards Cairo, leaving 600 dead on the battlefield. After a day's rest at Chebris, the French land force continued the pursuit. On 2 Thermidor, it arrived half a mile from the village of Mbaba copyright. The heat was unbearable and the army was exhausted and needed a rest, but there was not enough time and so Bonaparte drew up his 25,000 troops for battle approximately nine miles from the pyramids of Giza. He is said to have shown his army the pyramids behind the enemy's left flank and at the moment of ordering the attack shouted soldiers, see the tops of the pyramids a euro in accounts written long afterwards, this phrase was altered into soldiers, remember that from the top of these pyramids, Forty centuries of history contemplate you, though historians later discovered that the pyramids were not visible from the battlefield. This was the start of the so-called Battle of the Pyramids, a French victory over an enemy force of about 21,000 Mamluks. The French defeated the Mamluk cavalry with a giant infantry square, 
with cannons and supplies safely on the inside. In all 300 French and approximately 6,000 Egyptians were killed. The battle gave rise to dozens of stories and drawings. Dupuy's brigade pursued the routed enemy and at night entered Cairo, which had been abandoned by the Bey's Murad and Ibrahim. On 4 Thermidor, the notables of Cairo came to Giza to meet Bonaparte and offered to hand over the city to him. Three days later, he moved his main headquarters there. De Sakes was ordered to follow Murad, who had set off for Upper Egypt. An observation corps was put in place at El Kanka to keep an eye on the movements of Ibrahim, who was heading towards Syria. Bonaparte personally led the pursuit of Ibrahim, beat him at Salahi and pushed him completely out of Egypt. The transports had sailed back to France, but the battle fleet stayed and supported the army along the coast. The British fleet under the command of Horatio Nelson had been searching in vain for the French fleet for weeks. The British fleet had not found it in time to prevent the landings in Egypt, but on August 1 Nelson discovered the French warships anchored in a strong defensive position in the Bay of Abukar. The French believed that they were open to attack only on one side, the other side being protected by the shore. However, during the Battle of the Nile the arriving British fleet under Horatio Nelson managed to slip half of their ships in between the land and the French line, thus attacking from both sides. In a few hours 11 out of the 13 French ships of the line and 2 out of the 4 French frigates were captured or destroyed, the 4 remaining ships fled. This frustrated Bonaparte's goal of strengthening the French position in the Mediterranean Sea, and instead put it totally under British control. News of the naval defeat reached Bonaparte en route back to Cairo from defeating Ibrahim but, far from being worried, Malia copyright states. This disastrous event did not disconcert at all a euro ever impenetrable, he did not allow any emotion to appear that he had not tested in his mind. Having calmly read the dispatch which informed him that he and his army were now prisoners in Egypt, he said we no longer have a navy. Well. We'll have to stay here, or leave as great men just as the ancients did. The army then showed itself happy at this short energetic response, but the native Egyptians considered the defeat at Abukir as fortune turning in their favor and so from then on busied themselves to find means to throw off the hateful yoke the foreigners were trying to impose on them by force and to hunt them from their country. This project was soon put into execution. Canal of the Pharaohs After the naval defeat at Abukir, Bonaparte's campaign remained land-bound. However, his army still succeeded in consolidating power in Egypt, although it faced repeated nationalist uprisings, and Napoleon began to behave as absolute ruler of all Egypt. He set up a pavilion and from within it presided over a Fatih du Nil a Euro it was he who gave the signal to throw into the floats the statue of the river's fianx a copyright e, his name, and Mohammed's were mingled in the same acclamations on his orders gifts were distributed to the people, and he gave captains to his main officers. In a largely unsuccessful effort to gain the support of the Egyptian population, Bonaparte issued proclamations that cast him as a liberator of the people from Ottoman and Mamluk oppression, praising the precepts of Islam and claiming friendship between France and the Ottoman Empire despite French intervention in the breakaway state. This position as a liberator and Ottoman ally initially gained him solid support in Egypt and later led to admiration for Napoleon from Muhammad Ali of Egypt, who succeeded where Bonaparte had not in reforming Egypt and declaring its independence from the Ottomans. In a letter to a sheikh in August 1798, Napoleon wrote, I hope. 
I shall be able to unite all the wise and educated men of all the countries and establish a uniform regime based on the principles of the Quran which alone are true and which alone can lead men to happiness. However, Bonaparte's secretary Burian wrote that his employer had no serious interest in Islam or any other religion beyond their political value. Ottoman Offensives Bonaparte's principle was, to look upon religions as the work of men, but to respect them everywhere as a powerful engine of government. If Bonaparte spoke as a Musulman, it was merely in his character of a military and political chief in a Musulman country. To do so was essential to his success, to the safety of his army, and to his glory. In India he would have been for Ali, at Thibet for the Dalai Lama, and in China for Confucius. Shortly after Bonaparte's return from facing Ibrahim came Mohammed's birthday, which was celebrated with great pomp. Bonaparte himself directed the military parades for the occasion, preparing for this festival in the Cheek's house wearing oriental dress and a turban. It was on this occasion that the divan granted him the title Ali Bonaparte after Bonaparte proclaimed himself a worthy son of the Prophet and favorite of Allah. Around the same time he took severe measures to protect pilgrim caravans from Egypt to Mecca, writing a letter himself to the governor of Mecca. French Response Jaffa Mount Tabor Even so, thanks to the taxes he imposed on them to support his army, the Egyptians remained unconvinced of the sincerity of all Bonaparte's attempts at conciliation and continued to attack him ceaselessly. Any means, even sudden attacks and assassination, were allowed to force the infidels out of Egypt. Military executions were unable to deter these attacks and they continued. September 22, 1798 was the anniversary of the founding of the First French Republic and Bonaparte organized the most magnificent celebration possible. On his orders, an immense circus was built in the largest square in Cairo, with 105 columns round the edge and a colossal inscribed obelisk at the center. On seven classical altars were inscribed the names of heroes killed in the French Revolutionary Wars, whilst the structure was entered through a triumphal arch, on which was shown the Battle of the Pyramids. Here there was some awkwardness a euro the painting flattered the French but aggrieved the defeated Egyptians they were trying to win over as allies. On the day of the festival, Bonaparte addressed his troops, enumerating their exploits since the 1793 siege of Toulon and telling them. From the English, famous for arts and commerce, to the hideous and fierce Bedouin, you have caught the gaze of the world. Soldiers, your destiny is fair. This day, 40 million citizens celebrate the era of representative government, 40 million citizens think of you. After making himself master of Egypt, Bonaparte gave Egypt his version of the benefits of Western civilization. Cairo soon took on the appearance of a European city, with its administration confided to a divan chosen from among the best men of the province. At the same time the other cities received municipal institutions. An institute d'A per thousand gypped of French scholars was set up and he joined the title of president of the institute to the title of Akeda Copyright Messien. The conqueror became the legislator, setting up a library, a chemistry laboratory, a health service, a botanical garden, an observatory, an antiquities museum and a menagerie. Under Bonaparte's orders, the scholars drew up a comparative table of Egyptian and French weights and measures, wrote a French-Arabic dictionary and calculated a triple Egyptian, Coptic and European calendar. Two journals were set up in Cairo, 
one for literature and political economy under the name de copyright Kate a copyright Egyptian, and the other for politics under the title Korya a copyright Egyptian. Its numbers hugely reduced by deaths in action and from disease, the army could no longer hope for reinforcements from France after the naval disaster at Abu Kir. But Bonaparte tried to overcome this problem by levying from among the slaves in Egypt between the ages of 16 and 24 and turning the 3,000 sailors who had survived Abu Kir into a law copyright Jun Nautique. All the streets in Cairo were closed at night by gates to stop the inhabitants aiding the Arabs in a night attack on the French. Bonaparte removed these fences since the Egyptians could use them as barricades if they rose against the French a euro this removal proved to be justified by the events that soon followed. On October 22, 1798, while Bonaparte was in Old Cairo, the city's population was spreading weapons around the streets and fortifying strongpoints, especially at the Great Mosque. The chef de brigade Dupuis, Cairo's commander, was the first to be killed, then Solkowski, friend and aide-de-camp to Bonaparte. Excited by the sheikhs and imams, the Egyptians swore by the Prophet to exterminate all Frenchmen and any Frenchman they met a euro at home or in the streets a euro was mercilessly killed. Crowds rallied at the city gates to keep out Bonaparte who was repulsed and forced to take a detour to get in via the Bulak Gate. The French army's situation was critical a euro the British were menacing coastal towns, Murad Bey was still in the field in Upper Egypt, and Generals Menu and Dugwa were only just able to hold down Lower Egypt. The Arabs and the Egyptian peasants had common cause with those rising against the French in Cairo a euro the whole desert was in arms. A manifesto of the great lord was published widely throughout Egypt. This attack on the religion of the French stated, The French people are a nation of stubborn infidels and unbridled rascals. They look upon the Koran, the Old Testament and the New Testament as fables. Soon, troops as numerous as they are formidable will advance on us by land at the same time ships of the line as high as the mountains will cover the surface of the seas. If it please God, it is reserved for you to preside over their entire destruction, as dust is scattered by the wind, there will not remain a single vestige of these infidels, for the promise of God is formal, the hope of the wicked man will be deceived, and the wicked men will perish. Glory to the Lord of the Worlds! Bonaparte did not feel threatened by the storm building on all sides. Via his orders the Arabs were beaten back into the desert and the artillery was turned back on the rebel city. Bonaparte personally hunted down the rebels from street to street and forced them to concentrate their retreat in the Great Mosque. Luckily for the French the sky was covered with clouds and thunder was rumbling, a very rare phenomenon in Egypt. Many of the superstitious residents considered the thunder as a sign from heaven and they begged for mercy from their enemies. Bonaparte replied he is too late a euro you've begun, now I will finish. He then immediately ordered his cannon to open fire on the mosque. The French broke down the gates and stormed into the building, massacring the Egyptians inside. Back in absolute control of Cairo. Bonaparte sought out the authors and instigators of the revolt. Several sheikhs and many Turks or Egyptians were convicted of participation in the plot and executed. To complete his punishment, the city was hit by a high tax and its divan was replaced by a military commission. To negate the effects of the great lord's firman, the French posted a proclamation in all the cities of Egypt, ending in the words. Stop founding your hopes on Ibrahim and Murad, and put your trust in he who has empires in his discretion and who creates men. With Egypt quiet again and under his control, 
Bonaparte used this time of rest to visit Suez and see with his own eyes the possibility of a canal said to have been cut in antiquity between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean by order of the pharaohs. Before setting out on the expedition, he gave Cairo back its self-government as a token of its pardon a euro a new divan made up of 60 members replaced the military commission. Then, accompanied by his colleagues from the Institute, Bert Hallett, Monge, Eli Pari, Dudardra, Costas, Caffarelli, and followed by a 300-man escort, Bonaparte set out for the Red Sea and after three days marching across the desert he and his caravan arrived at Suez. After giving orders to complete the fortifications at Suez, Bonaparte crossed the Red Sea and on December 28, 1798 moved into Sinai to look for the celebrated mountains of Moses 17 kilometers from Suez. On his return, surprised by the rising tide, he ran the risk of drowning. Arriving back at Suez, after much exploration the expedition fulfilled its aim, finding the remains of the ancient canal built by Sanusret III and Necho II. In the meantime the Ottomans in Constantinople received news of the French fleet's destruction at Abukir and believed this spelled the end for Bonaparte and his expedition, trapped in Egypt. Sultan Selim III decided to wage war against France, and sent two armies to Egypt. The first army, under the command of Jezar Pasha, had set out with 12,000 soldiers, but was reinforced with troops from Damascus, Aleppo, Iraq, and Jerusalem. The second army, under the command of Mustafa Pasha, began on roads with about 8,000 soldiers. He also knew he would get about 42,000 soldiers from Albania, Constantinople, Asia Minor, and Greece. The Ottomans planned two offensives against Cairo, from Syria, across the desert of Salheya Belbez el Kanka, and from Rhodes by sea landing in the Abukir area or the port city of Damietta. In January 1799, during the canal expedition, the French learned of the hostile Ottoman movements and that Jezar had seized the desert fort of El Arak ten miles from Syria's frontier with Egypt, which he was in charge of guarding. Certain that war with the Ottoman Sultan was imminent and that he would be unable to defend against the Ottoman army, Bonaparte decided that his best defense would be to attack them first in Syria where a victory would give him more time to prepare against the Ottoman forces on roads. He prepared around 13,000 soldiers who were organized in divisions under the command of Generals Rainier, KLA Copyright Burr, Bonn, Lons, Division Cavalry under General Murat, Brigade of Infantry and Cavalry under Brigade Chief Basiares, Camel Company, artillery under Dom Ardine, and engineers, and sappers under Caffarelli. Every infantry and cavalry division had six cannons. Napoleon took sixteen siege cannons which were placed on ships in Damietta under the command of Captain Standelay. He also ordered Contra Amaral Perra copyright E to Jaffa with siege artillery pieces. The total artillery sent on the campaign was eighty cannon. Renier and the vanguard quickly arrived before Arish, captured it, destroyed part of the garrison and forced the rest to take refuge in the castle. At the same time he caused Ibrahim's Mamluks to flee and captured their camp. Bonaparte's French forces left Egypt on February 5, 1799 and, seven days after leaving Cairo, Bonaparte too arrived at Arish and bombarded one of the castle towers. The garrison surrendered two days later and some of the garrison joined the French army. After marching 60 miles across the desert the army arrived in Gaza, where it rested for two days, and then moved on to Jaffa. This city was surrounded by high walls flanked by towers. Jezar had entrusted its defense to elite troops, 
with the artillery manned by 1,200 Ottoman gunners. The city was one of the ways into Syria, its port could be used by his fleet and a large part of the expedition's success depended on its fall. This meant Bonaparte had to capture the city before advancing further, and so he laid siege to it from 3 a Euro 7 March. All the outer works were in the besiegers' power and a breach could be produced. When Bonaparte sent a Turk to the city's commander to demand his surrender, the commander beheaded him despite the envoy's neutrality and ordered a sortie. He was repulsed and on the evening of the same day the besiegers' cannonballs caused one of the towers to crumble. Despite the defenders' desperate resistance, Jaffa fell. Two days and two nights of carnage were enough to assuage the French soldiers' fury a Euro 4,500 prisoners were shot or beheaded by an executioner taken on in Egypt. This vengeful execution found apologists, who wrote that Napoleon could neither afford to hold such a large number of prisoners nor let them escape to join Jezar's ranks. Before leaving Jaffa, Bonaparte set up a divan for the city along with a large hospital on the site of the Carmelite Monastery at Mount Carmel to treat those of his soldiers who had caught the plague, whose symptoms had been seen among them since the start of the siege. A report from Generals Bonn and Rampin on the plague's spread worried Bonaparte. To calm his army, it is said he went into the sufferers' rooms, spoke with and consoled the sick and touched them saying see, it's nothing, then left the hospital and told those who thought his actions unwise it was my duty, I'm commander-in-chief. However, some later historians state that Napoleon avoided touching or even meeting plague sufferers to avoid catching it and that his visits to the sick were invented by later Napoleonic propaganda. For example, long after the campaign, Antoine Jean Gros produced the propaganda painting Bonaparte visiting the plague victims of Jaffa in 1804. This showed Napoleon touching a sick man's body, modeling him on an ancien R.A. copyright Gim King Healer touching sufferers from the king's evil during his coronation rites a euro this was no coincidence since 1804 was the year Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself emperor. From Jaffa the army set off for the coastal town of Acre. En route it captured Haifa and the munitions and provisions stored there, along with the castle at Jaff, the castle at Nazareth and the town of Tyre. The siege of Acre began on March 18 but the French were unable to take it and it was here that the Syrian campaign came to an abrupt halt. The city was defended by newly created Ottoman infantry elites under the command of Jezar Pasha and was right on the coast, enabling it to be reinforced and resupplied by the British and Ottoman fleets. After 60 days repeated attacks and two murderous and inconclusive assaults, the city remained uncaptured. Even so, it was still awaiting reinforcements by sea as well as a large army forming up in Asia on the Sultan's orders to march against the French. To find out the latter's movements, Jezar ordered a general sortie against Bonaparte's camp. This sortie was supported by its own artillery and a naval bombardment from the British. With his usual impetuosity, Bonaparte pushed Jezar's columns back against their own walls and then went to help KLA copyright Burr, who was retrenched in the ruins with 4,000 Frenchmen and 20,000 Ottomans under his command. Bonaparte conceived a trick which used all the advantages offered him by the enemy position, sending Murat and his cavalry across the River Jordan to defend the river crossing and Vial and Rampant to march on Nablus while Bonaparte himself put his troops between the Ottomans and the magazines. These maneuvers were successful, in what was known as the Battle of Mount Tabor. The enemy army, taken by surprise at many points at once, was routed and forced to retreat, 
leaving their camels, tents, provisions, and 5,000 dead on the battlefield. Returning to besiege Acre, Bonaparte learned that Rear Admiral Perra Copyright E had landed seven siege artillery pieces at Jaffa. Bonaparte then ordered two assaults, both vigorously repulsed. A fleet was sighted flying the Ottoman flag and Bonaparte realized he must capture the city before that fleet arrived there with reinforcements. A fifth general attack was ordered, which took the outer works, planted the French tricolor on the rampart, pushed the Ottomans back into the city and forced the Ottoman fire to relent. Acre was thus taken or about to capitulate. However, one of those fighting on the Ottoman side was the French A copyright Migra copyright and engineer officer Fa copyright Lipos, one of Bonaparte's classmates at the A per thousand coal militaire. Fa copyright Lipos ordered cannon to be placed in the most advantageous positions and new trenches dug as if by magic behind the ruins which Bonaparte's forces had captured. At the same time Sidney Smith, commander of the British fleet, and his ship's crews landed. These factors renewed the courage of the besieged and they pushed Bonaparte's force back, with stubborn fury on both sides. Three final consecutive assaults were all repulsed, convincing Bonaparte that it would be unwise to continue trying to capture Acre. He raised the siege in May and consoled his soldiers with the proclamation. After feeding the war for three months in the heart of Syria with a handful of men, taking 40 guns, 50 flags, 10,000 prisoners, raising the fortifications of Gaza, Kata Ffa, Jaffa, Acre, we shall return to Egypt. The French forces situation was now critical a euro the enemy could harass its rear as it retreated, it was tired and hungry in the desert, it was carrying a large number of plague sufferers. To carry these sufferers in the middle of the army would spread the disease, so they had to be carried in the rear where they were most at risk from the fury of the Ottomans, keen to avenge the massacres at Jaffa. There were two hospital depots, one in the large hospital on Mount Carmel and the other at Jaffa. On Bonaparte's orders, all those at Mount Carmel were evacuated to Jaffa and Tinchera. The gun horses were abandoned before Acre and Bonaparte and all his officers handed their horses over to the transport officer door, with Bonaparte walking to set an example. To conceal its withdrawal from the siege, the army set off at night. Arriving at Jaffa, Bonaparte ordered three evacuations of the plague sufferers to three different points a Euro one by sea to Damietta one by land to Gaza and one by land to Arish. During the retreat the army picked clean all the lands through which they passed, with livestock, crops and houses all destroyed by sword and fire and Gaza the only place to be spared, in return for remaining loyal to Bonaparte. To speed the retreat, Bonaparte also took the controversial step of killing prisoners and plague-stricken men along the way. His supporters argued that this was necessary given continuing harassment of stragglers by Ottoman forces. Finally, after four months away from Egypt, the expedition arrived back at Cairo with 1,800 wounded, after losing 600 men to the plague and 1,200 to enemy action. In the meantime Ottoman and British emissaries had brought news of Bonaparte's setback at Acre to Egypt, stating that his expeditionary force was largely destroyed and Bonaparte himself was dead. On his return Bonaparte scotched these rumours by re-entering Egypt as if he was at the head of a triumphal army, with his soldiers carrying palm branches, emblems of victory. In his proclamation to the inhabitants of Cairo, Bonaparte told them. He is back in Cairo, the Biegarda copyright, the head of the French army, General Bonaparte, who loves Muhammad's religion, 
he is back sound and well, thanking God for the favors he has given him. He has entered Cairo by the gate of victory. This day is a great day, no one has ever seen its like, all the inhabitants of Cairo have come out to meet him. They have seen and recognized that it is the same commander-in-chief, Bonaparte, in his own person, but those of Jaffa, having refused to surrender, he handed them all over to pillage and death in his anger. He has destroyed all its ramparts and killed all those found there. There were around 5,000 of Jezar's troops in Jaffa a euro he destroyed them all. At Cairo the army found the rest and supplies it needed to recover, but its stay there could not be a long one. Bonaparte had been informed that Murad Bey had evaded the pursuit by Generals de Sakes, Belliard, Dons Elliot, and Davist and was descending on Upper Egypt. Bonaparte thus marched to attack him at Giza, also learning that 100 Ottoman ships were off Abukir, threatening Alexandria. Without losing time or returning to Cairo, Bonaparte ordered his generals to make all speed to meet the army commanded by the Pasha of Rumlia, Saad Mustafa, which had joined up with the forces under Murad Bey and Ibrahim. Before leaving Giza, where he found them, Bonaparte rode to Cairo's divan, stating, Eighty ships have dared to attack Alexandria but, beaten back by the artillery in that place, they have gone to anchor in Abukir Bay, where they began disembarking. I leave them to do this, since my intention is to attack them, to kill all those who do not wish to surrender, and to leave others alive to be led in triumph to Cairo. This will be a handsome spectacle for the city. First Bonaparte advanced to Alexandria, from which he marched to Abukir whose fort was now strongly garrisoned by the Ottomans. Bonaparte deployed his army so that Mustafa would have to win or die with all his family. Mustafa's army was 18,000 strong and supported by several cannons, with trenches defending it on the landward side and free communication with the Ottoman fleet on the seaward side. Bonaparte ordered an attack on July 25 and the Battle of Abukir ensued. In a few hours the trenches were taken, 10,000 Ottomans drowned in the ocean and the rest captured or killed. Most of the credit for the French victory that day goes to Murat, who captured Mustafa himself. Mustafa's son was in command of the fort and he and all his officers survived but were captured and sent back to Cairo as part of the French triumphal procession. Seeing Bonaparte return with these high-ranking prisoners, the population of Cairo superstitiously welcomed him as a prophet warrior who had predicted his own triumph with such remarkable precision. The land battle at Abukir was Bonaparte's last action in Egypt, partly restoring his reputation after the French naval defeat at the same place a year earlier. However, with the Egyptian campaign stagnating and political instability developing back home, a new phase in Bonaparte's career was beginning a euro he felt that he had nothing left to do in Egypt which was worthy of his ambition and that the forces he had left to him there were not sufficient for an expedition of any importance outside of Egypt. He also foresaw that the army was getting yet weaker from losses in battle and to disease and would soon have to surrender and be taken prisoner by its enemies, which would destroy all the prestige he had won by his many victories. Bonaparte thus spontaneously decided to return to France. During the prisoner exchange at Abukir and notably via the Gazette de Frankfurt Sidney Smith had sent him, he was in communication with the British fleet, from which he had learned of events in France. As Bonaparte saw France was thrown back into retreat, its enemies had recaptured France's conquests, France was unhappy at its dictatorial government and was nostalgic for the glorious peace it had signed in the Treaty of Campo Formio a Euro as Bonaparte saw it, this meant France needed him and would welcome him back.
he only shared the secret of his return with a small number of friends whose discretion and loyalty were well known. He left Cairo in August 1799 on the pretext of a voyage in the Nile Delta without arousing suspicion, accompanied by the scholars Monge and Bird Hollett, the painter Denon, and generals Berthier, Murat, Lons, and Marmont. On August 23, 1799 a proclamation informed the army that Bonaparte had transferred his powers as commander-in-chief to General K.L.A. Copyright Burr. This news was taken badly, with the soldiers angry with Bonaparte and the French government for leaving them behind, but this indignation soon ended, since the troops were confident in K.L.A. Copyright Burr who convinced them that Bonaparte had not left permanently but would soon be back with reinforcements from France. As night fell, the frigate Murin silently moored by the shore, with three other ships escorting her. Some became worried when a British corvette was sighted at the moment of departure, but Bonaparte cried bah! We'll get there, luck has never abandoned us, we shall get there despite the English. On their 41-day voyage back they did not meet a single enemy ship to stop them, with some sources suggesting that Bonaparte had purchased the British fleet's neutrality via a tacit agreement, though others hold this unlikely, since many would argue that he also had a pact with Nelson to leave him to board on the Egyptian coast unopposed with the fleet bearing his large army. It has been suggested that Sidney Smith and other British commanders in the Mediterranean helped Napoleon evade the British blockade, thinking that he might act as a royalist element back in France, but there is no solid historical evidence in support of this conjecture. Acre On October 1 Napoleon's small flotilla entered port at Ayacho, where contrary winds kept them until October 8 when they set out for France. When the coast came in sight, ten British ships were sighted. Contra Amiral Gantome suggested changing course towards Corsica, but Bonaparte said no, this maneuver would lead us to England, and I want to get to France. This courageous act saved them and on October 8, 1799 the frigates anchored in the roads off Fra copyright use. As there were no sick men on board and the plague in Egypt had ended six months before their departure, Bonaparte and his entourage were allowed to land immediately without waiting in quarantine. At 6 p.m. he set off for Paris, accompanied by his chief of staff Berthier. He stopped off at saint Raphael, where he built a pyramid commemorating the expedition. The troops Bonaparte left behind were supposed to be honorably evacuated under the terms of a treaty KLA Copyright Burr had negotiated with Smith in early 1800, but British Admiral Keith reneged on this treaty, sending an amphibious assault force of 30,000 Mamluks against KLA Copyright Burr. KLA Copyright Burr defeated the Mamluks at the Battle of Heliopolis in March 1800 and then suppressed an insurrection in Cairo. However, on June 14, 1800 a Syrian student called Suleiman al-Hilabi assassinated KLA copyright Burr with a dagger in the heart, chest, left forearm, and right thigh. Command of the French army passed to General Menu, who held command from July 3, 1800 until August 1801. Menu's letter was published in L.E. Moniteur on September 6, with the conclusions of the committee charged with judging those responsible for the assassination. The committee, after carrying through the trial with all due solemnity and process, thought it necessary to follow Egyptian customs in its application of punishment, it condemned the assassin to be impaled after having his right hand burned and three of the guilty sheikhs to be beheaded and their bodies burned. The Anglo-Ottomans then commenced their land offensive, the French were defeated by the British in the Battle of Alexandria on March 21, 
surrendered at Fort Julian in April and then Cairo fell in June. Finally besieged in Alexandria from August 17 a Euro September 2, 1801, Menu eventually capitulated to the British. Under the terms of his capitulation, the British General John Helly Hutchinson allowed the French army to be repatriated in British ships. Menu also signed over to Britain the priceless hoard of Egyptian antiquities such as the Rosetta Stone which it had collected. After initial talks in Al Arish on January 30, 1802, the Treaty of Paris on June 25, 1802 ended all hostilities between France and the Ottoman Empire, resecuring Egypt for the Ottomans. Retreat from Acre An unusual aspect of the Egyptian expedition was the inclusion of an enormous contingent of scientists and scholars assigned to the invading French force. 167 in total. This deployment of intellectual resources is considered as an indication of Napoleon's devotion to the principles of the Enlightenment, and by others as a masterstroke of propaganda obfuscating the true motives of the invasion, the increase of Bonaparte's power. These scholars included engineers and artists, members of the Commission des Sciences et des Arts, the geologist Dolomou, Henri Joseph Reda de Copyright, the mathematician Gaspard Monge, the chemist Claude Louis Bert Hollet, Vivant Denon, the mathematician Jean Joseph Fourier, the physicist A. Perthausenchen Malice, the naturalist A. Perthausenchen Geoffroy Saint Hilaire, the botanist Allier Raffinota Lyle, and the engineer Nicolas Jacques Conte copyright of the Conservatoire National des Arts et ma copyright tiers. Their original aim was to help the army, notably by opening a Suez Canal, mapping out roads and building mills to supply food. They founded the Institut d'A. per thousand Gypt with the aim of propagating Enlightenment values in Egypt through interdisciplinary work improving its agricultural and architectural techniques for example. A scientific review was created under the title de copyright Cade a copyright Egyptian and in the course of the expedition the scholars also observed and drew the flora and fauna in Egypt and became interested in the country's resources. Back in Egypt the Egyptian institute that Napoleon established saw the construction of laboratories, libraries, and a printing press. The group worked prodigiously, and some of their discoveries were not finally catalogued until the 1820s. A young engineering officer, Pierre Frana Ois Xavier Bouchard, discovered the Rosetta Stone in July 1799. However, Many of the antiquities collected by the French in Egypt were seized by the British Navy and ended up in the British Museum A Euro only about 50 of the 5,000 Egyptian objects in the Louvre were collected during the 1799 A Euro 1801 Egyptian expedition. Even so, the scholars' research in Egypt gave rise to the description de la per thousand Egypt published on Napoleon's orders between 1809 and 1821. A Booker to Withdrawal Land Battle at a Booker Napoleon's discoveries in Egypt gave rise to fascination with ancient Egyptian culture and the birth of Egyptology in Europe. The printing press was first introduced to Egypt by Napoleon. He brought with his expedition a French, Arabic, and Greek printing press, which were far superior in speed, efficiency, and quality to the nearest presses used in Istanbul. In the Middle East, Africa, India, and even much of Eastern Europe and Russia, printing was a minor, specialized activity until the 1700s at least. From about 1720, the Mutafarika Press in Istanbul produced substantial amounts of printing, of which some Egyptian clerics were aware of at the time. Juan Cole reports that, 
Bonaparte was a master of what we would now call spin, and his genius for it is demonstrated by reports in Arabic sources that several of his more outlandish allegations were actually taken seriously in the Egyptian countryside. Bonaparte's initial use of Arabic in his printed proclamations was rife with error. In addition to much of the awkwardly translated Arabic wording being unsound grammatically, often the proclamations were so poorly constructed that they were simply undecipherable. The French Orientalist Jean-Michel de Venture de Paradis, perhaps with the help of Maltese aides, were responsible for translating the first of Napoleon's French proclamations into Arabic. The Maltese language is distantly related to the Egyptian dialect, however, classical Arabic differs greatly in grammar, vocabulary, and idiom. Venture de Paradis, alternatively, who had lived in Tunis, understood Arabic grammar and vocabulary, but did not know how to use them idiomatically. Bonaparte Leaves Egypt Bonaparte's Voyage to France End of the Campaign Scientific Expedition The Printing Press Analysis Mamelukes in French Service French Order of Battle Timeline and Battles Bibliography and further reading The Sunni Muslim clerics of the Al-Azhar University in Cairo reacted incredulously to Napoleon's proclamations. Abd al-Rahman al-Jabardi, a Karine cleric and historian, received the proclamations with a combination of amusement, bewilderment, and outrage. He berated the French's poor Arabic grammar and the infelicitous style of their proclamations. Over the course of Napoleon's invasion of Egypt, Al-Jabardi wrote a wealth of material regarding the French and their occupation tactics. Among his observations, he rejected Napoleon's claim that the French were Muslims and poorly understood the French concept of a republic and democracy a Euro words which did not exist at the time in Arabic. In addition to its significance in the wider French Revolutionary Wars, the campaign had a powerful impact on the Ottoman Empire in general and the Arab world in particular. The invasion demonstrated the military, technological, and organizational superiority of the Western European powers to the Middle East, leading to profound social changes in the region. The invasion introduced Western inventions, such as the printing press, and ideas, such as liberalism and incipient nationalism, to the Middle East eventually leading to the establishment of Egyptian independence and modernization under Muhammad Ali Pasha in the first half of the 19th century and eventually the Nada, or Arab Renaissance. To modernist historians, the French arrival marks the start of the modern Middle East. The campaign ended in what some back home in France believed was a failure with 15,000 French troops killed in action and 15,000 by disease. However, Napoleon's reputation as a brilliant military commander remained intact and even rose higher, despite some of his failures during the campaign. This was due to his expert propaganda, such as his Coria d'A per thousand gypped set up to propagandize the expeditionary force itself and support its morale. That propaganda even spread back to France, where news of defeats such as at sea in Aboukir Bay and on land in Syria were suppressed. Defeats could be blamed on the now-assassinated KLA copyright Burr, leaving Napoleon free from blame and with a burnished reputation. This opened his way to power and he profited from his reputation by engineering his becoming first consul in the coup d'a copyright tat of 18 Brumaire. Colonel Barthélemy Serra took the first steps towards creating a Mameluke corps in France. On September 27, 1800 he wrote a letter from Cairo to the first consul, couched in an oriental style. 
he regretted being very far away from Napoleon and offered his total devotion to the French nation and expressed the Mamluks' wish to become the bodyguard to the first consul. They wished to serve him as living shields against those who would seek to harm him. The first consul became receptive of admitting a unit of carefully selected cavalrymen as his personal guard. He had an officer pay appropriate respects to the foreign troops and provided Napoleon himself with a full report to the number of refugees.